Daniel Kowalski is the founder of Service Monster, also in younger days as an athlete. He's a southpaw with an 83 mile an hour fastball, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And apparently he's on Gary Vaynerchuk's inner circle. I don't know if you guys followed that story, but he, he made this like really cool little tweet about something that happened and Vaynerchuk's like, what? This can't be right. Are you familiar with Vaynerchuk? Yeah. And he's like, that's bullshit, excuse me. We're not gonna do that. And he, he reached out to Joe and says, I'm flying you to New York to meet with me. We're gonna make this right. I'm like, ultimate customer service. And maybe he'll tell the story, but I would like you to give a big rock star welcome to Joe Kowalski from Service Monster. You got me? Hey, there I go. You guys hear me okay? Cool. They're gonna be working on uh, an image. It's one image, it's not a slide. I'm not gonna bore you with uh, PowerPoint today. So when they come up, there's a little contact information there for uh, following me, you can do that. I am super excited today. I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, leadership. Um, how many of you guys follow me in social media? So about half, not bad. Thank you so much for your attention today and coming out and listening to me monologue. I know you could be nursing the hangover, but instead you've chosen to come listen to me. And so I'm gonna to try to bring as much value in this presentation as I can. If just one or two of you go home and make some small changes in your business that have an impact, then I win. So I'm very excited to kind of go over this leadership stuff with you guys today. Um, I want to thank Thad and the ICE team for asking me to speak. I can talk about a wider range of topics, and when I asked Thad what he wanted me to talk about, he didn't hesitate. He said in the 10 years he's been doing these talks, the most requested, yes, underserved topic has been employee management, company culture, in short, leadership. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited. But I'm also a little nervous. I want to open with a personal story, but it doesn't put me in the best light. It's important to the conversation today, but it's actually the worst thing I've ever done. I was in second grade, I had a friend named Chad, uh, thick as thieves, hanging out every lunch and recess. And one dreary winter day, Chad brings an umbrella up to the playground. And at one point the wind picks up and almost rips it out of his hand. My little brain got to, got to work in. See, we had this structure on the playground called the tower. It was a platform on stilts, surrounded by rope ladders. In my brain, I thought it'd be pretty freaking cool to get on top of the tower and use that umbrella, jump off, like Mary Poppins, glide over the playground to the wonderment of all the children below, softly landing in the newly fallen snow. But I was only about 90% sure that was gonna work. Yeah, so I convinced my buddy Chad to take the maiden voyage. <laughs> He's standing on the railing and he looks back at me with fear and apprehension on his face. And I must have said something or did something, a smile or a nod, something reassuring because his fear softened and he jumped. And he did not glide gracefully over the playground. He fell straight down, the fabric ripping off the frame of his umbrella, landing on the asphalt feet first, crumpled in a heap, smashed his face on the ice, busted his lip open, there was blood everywhere. In the end, Chad was okay. And I never even got in trouble for my part. But I felt like an asshole for two weeks. I learned two very important lessons on that experience. The first, I was gonna have a hell of a career in sales. Right? I mean, he jumped. And the second, obviously, and most important, that I wanted to use my gifts to help people rise, not watch them fall. And so from that day until this, I have been a student of leadership. And I'll be a student of leadership until the day I die. People are hard. They're messy. They're opinionated. 
Everybody's got their own agenda. But let's take a step back for a minute. Like, why do we even need to worry about leadership anyways? Right? We're creating jobs. We're not leading people to war. Or even worse, trying to lead an association. UAMCC folks might want to talk to the IICRC folks circuit 2007. Maybe that's too much inside baseball. I mean, I think we can all agree that we need people, right? In order to scale your business, you have to increase the number of billable hours. I want to repeat that because I think you guys get lost in that sometimes. In order to scale your business, you have to increase your number of billable hours. You're going to hire technicians, office people, and essentially every hat you wear will become its own department if you get big enough. Some of those hours will be billable and the ones that aren't have to be supported by the ones that are. It's a tricky bit of math when you're first getting started, but the hack is to focus on the billable hours. Like you can sub out some of the other work until you get big enough to take it on yourself, right? Those non-billable functions. And I see you guys, a lot of single owner operators trying to hustle their way to prosperity. I get it, like I'm all about the hustle. But I think sometimes you guys approach it the wrong way. I learned a long time ago, you only get 50, maybe 60 hours a week if you want to keep a marriage intact. And those 20 sacrificial hours, the ones you give up birthdays and baseball for, honestly, they don't pencil out to all that much. If I hire five amazing employees, that's 200 hours a week of horsepower, 20 no, sorry, 10 times more than our hustle. So yeah, I, I think we can all agree that we need people. But leadership, we're the job creators, right? The economy runs on our back. We take all the risk, both personal and financial, and when we win, we create more jobs. In our grandfather's day, they were lucky to have a job. Both of my grandparents worked in the same factory their entire lives and they were totally happy. So it should be pretty easy to find people who are willing to work, right? But it looks more like this. You put your job ad out, you get 20 resumes. Eight of them are legit. You have four phone calls, two in-person interviews. The person that you wanted went to work somewhere else. You bring in the number two and after a few weeks he quits. Or even worse, you realize you've made a horrible mistake but you wait too long to fire them because you know you're gonna to have to start the whole damn process all over again when you do. It sucks. I mean, why are good people so hard to find these days? It's like they're all lazy, entitled to everything. They wanna show up on Monday, be CEO by Friday. You find a good one, they only hang out long enough to find a job somewhere else, making a few bucks more. There's no loyalty. There's no patience. They don't have respect for authority. They can barely show up to work on time. And when they finally do show up with holding their triple espresso latte smelling like pot, they're wondering why you're being so mean to them. Blows me away. There's no grit anymore, right? Nobody takes pride in their work. Like you can either choose to do a good job Choose to show up on time. Choose not to piss off Mrs. Jones. Choose to put your tools back, or you can choose to find another damn job. That dude's an asshole. I wouldn't want to work for him. Let's call him Richard. Now, Richard's not wrong entirely, but he has it twisted. He's making an enemy of the employee before they even get in the door. And that is not how you're going to win. You have to realize it's all your fault. You got to come to terms with that. As the business owner, everything is your fault. It's your fault they didn't show up on time. It's your fault they didn't put the tools back. It's your fault they pissed off Mrs. Jones. And it's your fault they don't take their job seriously. It's all our fault. When you blame other people, you're giving away your power. Your power. I mean, what are we even doing here? 
We started businesses and we're business owners because we want control. Control over our lives, control over the work we do, and control over our impact in the world. Why would you give up that control simply because you can't admit that you need to be a better leader? We're business owners. We should always be working on being a better leader, just like we work on being a better technician, a better salesperson, and a better marketer. Learn how to inspire the people you've chosen to take on this journey with you. Let them be part of your story. I get it though, right? Everybody's working under their grandfather's employee manual, but they got it wrong. You know the org chart looks like a pyramid, has boss man on top, followed by the people who report to them, followed by the people that report to them. It's upside down, guys. It's not a pyramid, it's a tree. You provide the roots, the support, the vision, the leadership necessary in order for your business to flourish. You've gotta train and work with those people and support them because they're the ones working those billable hours. It's not that complex. So yeah, leadership, right? We gotta get those people to really buy in to what we're doing. You can't run your business like the military. Right? Authoritarian rule will only get you so far. Just ask North Korea. In order to be a good leader, you've gotta have some empathy, right? Realize that nobody is gonna love your business the way you do, nobody. And that if you can get them to 85 or 90%, you have an amazing employee. But also realize we don't call those who can do what you do employees. We call them competitors, right? It's a big deal. So learn how to inspire those people. About 12 years ago, I threw away my corporate playbook. I wasn't getting the results I wanted. I realized I needed to start hiring amazing people, not positions, not resumes. And it's a minor change in our business, but it's had massive impact. Here's an example. At the bottom of each job ad, we put, we'll trade education for passion. And it works. We are very good at cultivating young talent. About five years ago, I needed an engineer, another engineer to add to the team. And across my resume comes this desk from this stock boy from Walmart named Aaron. Corporate America would have tossed it. No education, no real world experience. But I felt he had some passion that I could use, that I could leverage. We brought him in for the interview and I asked him a question I ask a lot of our engineers. Talk to me about any works you've done outside school or work. And when I ask recent college grads this question, their eyes glaze over. Again, I'm not interested in forced projects. I can teach a monkey how to code. But Aaron, he lit up like the Luxor Skybeam. This dude is talking about how he was working on his passionate project at two o'clock in the morning, getting things just so. He still works with us today, and he's one of the leading engineers on the user interface of Service Monster 6, the pretty parts that you click on. We gave him a shot when no one else would, and that kind of trust builds fierce loyalty. We work together to realize that his dreams were in alignment with the vision of the company. And that's a common theme with a lot of my teams. We've even created a few other business owners. Obviously not competitors do, doing other things, but it's pretty amazing when you can cultivate talent and help them move in that direction. I'm on the heels of some major changes in my company. I stand up here today talking about leadership after one week of two employees quitting and another letting go. Like we've we pretty much turned over our sales department to the exception of Sam, which I think a lot of you guys know. Sam's a great guy. 
So I'm still dealing with this, although sometimes those maneuvers are strategic in order to get the team you want, not necessarily the team you have. It's, uh, it's not easy. Leadership, firing, hiring, the whole process. It's hard. It's, it, it's the core of what we do though. This is how we build our businesses on people. You cannot scale any way but one-on-one -on -one when it comes to inside your company. And that's tough. It's a tough pill to swallow. You have got to find your why, right? That's what Simon Siddick would say. He's a leader, speaker, author, and a student on leadership. Find your why, your company's purpose, the one unifying banner that you can completely get behind. As a carpet cleaner, a pressure washer, window cleaner, you guys all know what you do, right? You clean carpet, you clean window. Some of you here might actually know how you do it. And I'm not talking about the technical aspect of the cleaning, I'm talking about what makes you different? What's your differentiating factor? What's that thing that will choose you over somebody else? But do you guys know why you do what you do? And it can't be about making money, right? That's, that's gotta be the byproduct. Your why has to be that unified front. Let's take an example. Uh, something out of the blue, I don't know. Uh, software company with venture capital, who sells customer relation management some services to the service industry. Their what is, hey, we have this nice uh, CRM. Their how is, we don't have a lot of features, so it's super easy to use. Wanna buy one? Meh, I'm uninspired. The why goes to the $20 million in investment, not to the people that they're supposed to be servicing. Let's take a look at Service Monster. Our why is to help unlikely business owners build successful businesses. How we do that is by creating a team and a product that's dedicated towards that purpose. And what we offer is amazing customer retention, field service, and marketing automation platform. Would you like to join the team? Completely different messaging and something that every employee can get behind. It's a big deal. Look, I know it sounds like woo woo and hippy dippy. Like you can't be all empathetic and you can't like give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Like I get it, Richard. But that's not really what I'm saying. I'm a huge fan of the motto, hire slow, fire fast. That's where you get your power back. That's where you take control. I've read a couple articles that kind of refute the whole higher slow part of the equation, but they, they got it wrong. Don't misunderstand. It's not that you take a long time to make the hire. You want to take a long time to find the right person. And you might find them right off the bat, who knows, but it's a barometer. I just see way too many service providers simply trying to find warm bodies. They're a commodity, not somebody who you want to take on your journey. And you cannot build a culture if you don't know what culture you want to build. It's got to be intentional. I work in the last 15 years with thousands of service companies. I know hundreds very well. I know dozens extremely well. And it always amazes me how different each company culture is. It's like a fingerprint from the leadership. You can't escape it. If you build it on purpose, you can make good things happen. But if you don't, you're going to scale your issues. That's really tough to deal with. Scaling's not easy, right? Some, some people just want to bail out altogether. Yeah, I just, I tried the employee thing. I'm not really, don't want to deal with it. People are too this, people are too that. Again, it's that blame game. If you really want to scale your business, you have to have people. You've got to include them. You've got to help them go through that journey with you.
So how do you bridge the gap? How do you go from resumes to amazing culture? Okay. It's got to start with the why. Company manifesto, think about it, at nauseum, hours and hours and hours a day. And once you have it, write it down and make sure everybody knows it. Communicate it to the entire company. Along with that, create some company characteristics that you would like to follow. Maybe it's amazing customer service. Maybe it's attention to detail. And when you define those characteristics, then you can take actionable items to get you there. For instance, if you really want to build an amazing customer service experience, you might want to overstaff your office. Make sure nobody falls through the cracks and everybody's following procedure. If we really want to build a business where our primary goal is to help unlikely service providers build amazing businesses, then we're going to offer you things whether or not you spend a dime with us. We're going to create content that helps those business owners understand what they're doing. And they don't even have to ever call us or purchase any of our products. Because our why is that strong. I'm using my resources, my horsepower, my treasure to deliver content to you guys to help you. And if you want to build a business that focuses on attention to detail, your trucks are going to be washed every morning, your techs are going to be groomed in uniform, and everyone in the company is going to be focusing on it because you did it on purpose. So identifying that company culture is a big deal. It's the first thing you need to do before you really start building the culture. When you actually go to hire somebody, the first thing you should do is reverse engineer the job you want. Even to the point where you're kind of imagining what your employees look like. I mean, not physically look like, but what are their characteristics, right? Do you want a mousy person in sales? Probably not. Thought experiment, let's do this. I can fix your, all of your employee problems with one piece of advice. All of them. Pay every position in your company $250,000 a year. Obviously not sustainable, but as a thought experiment, let's run it through for a second. What kind of team could you build with that? Best technicians, the best agents, the best marketers, the best salespeople. Everyone in your community would know, holy crap, I really wanna go work for that company because they pay a shit ton of money and they have a why. As you process, that's a thought experiment I want you guys to go over over these next you know, month or so. As you do that, imagine them all as like superheroes, right? They all got GI Joe card indexes. Like they're just all ninjas. Like what does that card look like? Now, obviously, we can't hire them because they come with a $250,000 price tag. But rewind the clock. Find these people when they're 19. Become part of their origin story. Whoa. What happens then? My immediate go-to for superheroes is Wolverine. I think you'd make an awful employee. So maybe Captain America might be better. But if we found Captain America before he got all juiced up and he was helping us build a business... Man, integrity, honesty, like the characteristics that we want. So when you look at a position, first imagine who that person might be like, what they, what they might feel like in the company. How can they benefit your culture, not just what they can do. Then define the job. Write down a job description. Include seven to ten bullet points that identify what you want them to do and be responsible for. Cool, now we've got a company manifesto which defines our why, company characteristics, and a job description from a reverse engineered vision of who we want in the company. Now we take those pieces of information and we craft an advertisement. This is another mistake I see a lot of you guys making. You spend so much time in advertising to your clients, but yet, hey, I'm offering a job. That's good enough. If somebody wants to get paid, they'll come work for me. No. Because the all-stars, the superheroes, the Captain America is not going to want to work for just that company. The younger generation wants to know why. They want to be involved. They want to make a difference. 
we have to offer them that opportunity. But we also have to identify who we want in those positions. So yeah, craft an ad, something that looks amazing, something that when you read it, you're inspired. You want to, you know what, I, I might want to, go, never thought about cleaning carpets before, but holy crap, like I could go learn how to build a business. I could go learn more about sales and marketing. I can go learn a craft. You guys have an amazing amount to offer. Don't undersell that. All right, so now the interview process. You guys all know it, it's pretty simple. You put out feelers, put out job descriptions, you talk to employees, other amazing all-star employees, and you start getting in resumes. You have to go through the whole resume process, combing through them and then making phone calls, hopefully getting an in-person interview. Things go well there, you do a background check. If everything checks out, you make an offer. How many of you guys skip the background check? Yeah, don't do that. I've been burned, don't do it. And it's not just because you're looking for something in their past, like uh, something you know, that they did illegal. It's amazing what you can get by things that aren't said. And you call back in a previous employer, and be careful because most questions are the wrong questions. Legally, you can get yourself in trouble here. We actually limit ourselves to one question. Would you hire them again? It's a very safe question. And most of the time, if you get a mealy mouth answer, you've got your answer. Amazing people leave awake. And they'll be like, dude, I can't believe I lost this person. Yeah, you want to hire them, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys have gone through this process, one or two have come across your past like that. And, and then the other way too, like, oh, yeah, uh, sure, I guess I hire him. No. Take a long time to find the right people. Hire slow. So we're going through this interview process, some tips, right? Looking at the resume, be lenient. In corporate America, I was pretty strict. Typos and spelling errors. If you're looking for someone to be in the home and pushing the wand and being nice and smiley to Mrs. Jones, do they really need to be able to spell existentialism? So look for the people behind the resume. I just went through this exercise because we're filling out our sales staff, right? And so I'm combing through resumes and, and I'm looking for flavor. I'm looking for interest. I'm looking for passions that I can leverage. When you call them, keep the conversation short. This isn't, don't do the whole phone interview. Don't do the whole interview over the phone. The phone interview should be a flavor. Like, is it, a char is it, is it somebody that I might be okay with bringing in? Like, is a personality mesh? Are we, are we looking for a connection here? If you have that, awesome, bring them in. And then include your teammates in the interview process. Let them feel like they're helping you build the team and they're gonna give you perspective you didn't have. And a lot of times you're looking for the no, right? You're looking for every reason to hire somebody, but then you're looking for the reason not to hire them. Reverse that. Look for the inspiration to hire them. Assume that it's going to be a no. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Again, it's not easy. You need warm bodies. You need people to push them on. I need people on the sales floor. I need people in training now. But we're going to take a long time to find those people, even though the people I've got have to do a little bit more work than what they're normally used to doing. Because it's more damaging to find the wrong person. It takes way too long retraining and rehiring and the morale it does to your team, it's not good. So you bring them in for the interview, you got your team surrounded. I like to spend maybe five or 10 minutes on how does your actual resume line up with the job description, bring the job description into. Talk about that for a few minutes. But my favorite part of the in-person interview is an origin story. Make them talk about their life from beginning to end, maybe not beginning, usually like maybe early high school. Like what motivates them? What moves them through life? Why did they make certain decisions? Why did they move here? Why did they chase that girl over there? Like understand their, their path. You can learn a lot about a person by this story, even if it's not the words that they're telling. It's how they're telling it. 
how they communicate, how they make you feel. Then you like them, sure, do the background check. Make sure everything looks good there. And then submit an offer. Include the job description, how much you're going to pay them, when they're going to start, what time they're going to start, who they're going to report to. Make it thorough. Send the email off, I'll call them immediately after. Like, be quick when you find somebody that you really want. Because if you see the gold in them, so do other employees. Call them up, say, hey, dude, I just sent you an app. I just sent you an offer. If they're like, oh, that's so awesome, thank you so much, cool. I've also learned, though, the inverse isn't necessarily true. Not all people are, like, super excited when you tell them that you're offering them a job. So watch for that. It's not really an indicator if they're going to be an amazing employee. Sometimes you caught them off guard. Sometimes they weren't really sure what was going on. Sometimes they're processing, right? Not everybody's so extroverted. And then, your first day to screw up a new employee begins on day one. When you're not set up for proper training. You're going to take a rock star and put them in the corner and have them twiddle his thumbs for a couple days while you figure out what the hell to do with them? Make sure you've got a plan. Now, when you hire your first few employees, you're not going to have SOPs, standard operating procedures, but I encourage you to get them sooner rather than later. Document each step of the process that you do. It makes hiring and training people so much easier. You can hand them a sheet of paper and say, this is your guidebook, this is your Bible. If you follow this rule, you cannot get in trouble, even if you screw something up, because it'll be my fault for not documenting it correctly. So that's the, kind of the hiring process, right? A couple little tips in there. Most of you guys know how that works out. Let's talk about firing for a second. A lot of speakers will just glaze over this topic because it's uncomfortable. Simon Sinek, who I love the find your why, has something I don't love so much. He says, treat employees like family. You can't fire family. Why would you fire an employee? Not buying into that one. I mean, I can do a whole hour-long comedy speech on why that analogy for your family might not be the best idea. You get to choose who you take on this journey with you. The hardest part of that is choosing not to have mediocre employees. You fire somebody for cause, that's easy, right? They didn't show up for work multiple times. They didn't call their boss. All right, sorry. I, I can't create an environment where that's okay because now my all-stars are going to be pissed off that someone isn't really pulling their weight. Right? That culture that you're trying to build needs to be homogenous. You can't have a couple people that are, you know, even if they're rock stars, let's say you have the best salesperson in the world, but they're just jerks. Get rid of them. It's, just, it's not worth it. It's not worth the, the cancer that they cause within the company. Firing people is never easy, though. But firing them because they're just okay, that's hard. But I want you to put your science cap on for a second, because there's this concept that I really love, I talk about all the time, called state. See, in the computer world, when nothing's happening, there's no instructions going, everything's in a state of rest. All the memory, all the hard drive, like every little bit and bob, it's just static. It's, it stays put. It's frozen. Issue a command, and we call what's called transition. Things move, and then they stop, and then you're at state again. In physics, the dimension of time is expressed as a matter of state as well. It's kind of like a film reel, right? Each one of the frames on a film wheel. As we move through time, state's changing. But in any one moment in time, the universe is fixed and there's a state. Our lives are very much a matter of state. It is what it is today, but it is not what it will be tomorrow. I have five kids. I have to remind myself of this all the time. My 20-year-old is currently in a state I am not happy with. Hopefully, the state will change later. So relating this back to letting people go, at that moment in time, it's tough for you. And usually, as entrepreneurs, we've already lost some sleep over it. 
right? It's never really a surprise when you fire somebody. It shouldn't be a surprise for them. If you have an issue, the first thing you need to do is set them down and say, look, we got an issue, and if this continues, you can't work here anymore. Be very direct, very upfront. Empathetically, what's going on? How can we help? You've been a rock star, but now things have changed. And then if things persist, let them deal with it somewhere else. The state at that moment in time is, you're ruining my life. I can't believe you're doing this. You've heard it. But I've also seen that state changes. And those same people, a year later, will thank you. Thank you. I was in that job. I wasn't really happy. Now I'm at a place where I fit in better. I'm actually really like where I'm at. Right? Nobody ever, I won't say nobody maybe, but in America, very few people ever die because they get fired. Don't settle for mediocre. Build amazing teams. Cultivating. You've got rock stars. How do you make sure they stick around? Obviously, pay is a good one. Continuing to reward them little bit by little bit as you can, increasing their pay but also giving them chances to fail, right? If you've got somebody who you think might be a good leader, coach them, educate them. If it turns out they maybe didn't do so well, that's okay. Like, roll them back, it's not a big deal. But give them an opportunity. Let them join in your why, let them join in that focus, moving that company forward. Again, people wanna be inspired and they wanna make a difference. It's not just about the paycheck anymore. How much time do I got here? Seven minutes, oh, that's good. So I basically wanna wrap up here. I'd like to do a little q and although I don't know we're gonna have time. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna leave you with a final thought. Why did Chad jump? Why is Aaron still with us? And why is Richard ultimately gonna be struggling day after day after day? Chad jumped because he believed in a vision so clearly that he was willing to risk bodily harm in order to see it through. Aaron's still with us because our goals are still in alignment. And he sees our vision well enough to work at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock Friday night when stuff needs to get done. And Richard is gonna have a problem because he sees people as a commodity. He has no empathy. Swap them out, no big deal, hire another minimum wage dude. Guys, it all comes down to this. When you can get people to believe in your vision so clearly they see it as their own, businesses are easy to build, forget about that. You could do so much more. And that is the true power of leadership. Thanks, guys. Five. All right, so thank you very much. Why don't we, we do have time for like one or two questions. So if you've got a question like that. It doesn't have to be about leadership either. If you guys have any questions at all, I'd love to be able to tackle them. Anybody right here? Here. Um, thank you very much. I, I love the hire slow and fire fast. What about personality profiles during that hiring process? Have you ever done that? Or Absolutely. Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, again, you're reverse engineering the person that you want in the position, right? And so sometimes I'll even envision what that person feels like to talk to. Like, obviously, salespeople, I want happy and upbeat and you know, people who are willing to help and you know, motivate. And then maybe in support, I want people who are more attention to detail and who will take the time to go through things, right? I absolutely envision the profile, uh, the psychological profile. I'm willing to bend on it though a little bit, right? I'm not gonna be so staunch, like set that this is the person that I want that I overlook a good person. But yeah, no, I've been doing that now for 10 years. We just hired a new videographer uh, to, um, self videographer to document service monster training videos and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I knew exactly the profile I wanted. I took three rounds of interviewing. It took us like six weeks to find the person and now she's killing it. I love it, found the exact person that I wanted and, and it's just, it just works. Yeah. More questions? One more. 
Yeah. Come on. Somebody's got a question. Way over there. I don't know you at all. Can you give us a little history? Oh, of myself. Yeah. Sure. How many of you guys have no idea who I am? Yeah, there's about like 10 of you. Um, my name is Joe Kowalski. I am the CEO and founder of Service Monster. Um, it's a CRM for the service industry. Um, my very, very quick story is at 21, I was working in a factory for minimum wage. No college education. I had a new wife and new baby on the way. That's where my story starts. And then I basically just read books and busted ass and became a biomedical polymer R&D chemist working side by side with dual PhDs. And then that QA process took too long, so I went to the QA lab and learned how to program to shorten the three-day QA time to a six-hour QA time. And then fell in love with programming, started working for Fortune 500 companies, again, side-by-side -side with educated people. I have no education. I was just killing them on the floor. Found out that I loved programming so much, engineering and team building. Um, I started Service Monster in 2003. No VC funding, no loans of any kind. Now we're a $2.5 million, 36-person company. All right. Let's hear it for Joe. Thanks, guys. Excellent. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Yeah. <laughs>